So, hello again. Um, I am going to talk about, well, yeah, different things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I titled the presentation Care and Crypto Economy. Um, and I wanted to just start by saying how, what I, like, we've been talking about feminist uh, finance, feminist econo economics, uh, and I wanted to sort of start by saying how that inspires my thinking about care, um, which is really based on rethinking what value is, so not just economic value, but care as a value that we might use to, to, to organize society, um, that is aware of structural in inequalities, um, care for not just humans, but also non-human life, um, and ultimately to create ways of living together that are non-extractive and in which people can s determine for themselves how to do that. Uh, so all of this sort of exists under the header of care for me. Um, and I also <laughs> dropped a term in my abstract, which was crypto feminism, uh, which I thought would be interesting to think about for a second longer to uh, frame what I'm trying to do in this presentation. Maybe also, before I start, I should learn from Ruth <laughs> to uh, also state my, my um, frustration, awkwardness, and, well, struggle in the space that I am, um, because um, I talk about crypto and blockchain, um, and um, in my, so this is part of my PhD research, and in my PhD I'm looking at very much mainstream things, the very much the opposite of what Ruth has been talking about earlier, um, which is, are things that frustrate me, but they motivate me to like, <laughs> Uh, write uh, very critical things about them. Um, and, but um, sometimes that can lead down a track of sort of determinism, like this is all shit and we need to burn it. And I don't believe that. Um, I don't want to believe that. I need to find ways for myself to remind myself and to give my, myself um, a framework of thinking that opens this up because um, there are different ways of using this technology or thinking about this technology. Um, um, and that's why I'm talking about imaginaries in my PhD as well, not so much this, the specific technical capacities of it, but the cultures around it, how we talk about it, the discourse, because I think the discourse can also create new possibilities. Back to crypto feminism. This was a sort of disclaimer I, want, I didn't want to forget. Um, so, um, to think about what crypto feminism might mean, I think we have to sort of go back to cyber feminism. And I don't want to go back to <laughs> the, or like the whole history of cyber feminism. Um, we've had a little conversation over lunch, that, um, or breakfast actually. Um, that did a bit of that, um, but um, I wanted to just very like uh, selectively pick um, one artist basically that I think can be a guiding light through the sort of uh, framework that I'm going to present to you, which is Tabitha Rezer. Um, I picked one, one work here, but it's basically about her whole work that sort of combines a sort of techno social political criticism um, with feminism, Afrofuturism. The work is very meditative, but at the same time thought provoking. I put those two, two words together and I thought actually that's very contradictory, but it does it. Um, and uh, so this, uh, this frame is from Deep Down Tidal, which uh, traces the histories of like colonialism and how those are replicated in, for example, like uh, the internet cables under the, under the oceans and the sort of materialized power relations that they produce. Um, and it sort of tries to help people unlearn colonial knowledge 
um, and sort of trace alternative meanings of life, uh, rediscover origin myths and make new ones, um, break open rationalities to make different futures possible. Um, and I think this sort of, the, the crypto feminism I, I hope for does all of these things. It is political, it's historically aware, um, it's future oriented, and it's intersectional. Um, so this I would say is a sort of a good um, benchmark or a good, I don't know if that's the right word, but a good aim to, ho to a good goal to aim for, I guess, to be something like this. Um, but um, <laughs> I have to correct myself. I use the word crypto feminism, but I don't think that's the right word. I, um, it sounds nice and it's cyber feminism, crypto feminism, it, you know, it, it rolls off the tongue uh, nicely, but um, I don't want to talk about crypto specifically or only. Um, I think it's about blockchain um, and the affordances of blockchain that might flow in different ways into different applications like cryptocurrencies or like NFTs or like uh, DAOs. Um, so um, we have to be aware of the, um, um, the way blockchain continues certain things from uh, internet uh, culture and technology, but also how it breaks, um, breaks things or makes new affordances possible, new ways of governing, new ways of owning. Um, so just like that, also I think blockchain feminism, as I think is the better term, continue certain things or could continue certain things from cyber feminism, but also do new things. Um, and one possible way to think through what blockchain feminism could be is to, has been for me to uh, look at the work of Sylvia Winter, a decolonial theorist uh, from Jamaica. Um, and I think actually accidentally Looking back, I think it really resonates with uh, Tabitha Lazare's work as well. Um, and I've just been in a sort of deep, deep, um, deep dive obsession with Sylvia Winter. So I would just like to take you along with that uh, and to think about, use that to think about what care could be, care for life could look like uh, in and around blockchains. Um, but first, some terrible stuff uh, that very much lacks care so that we know what we're up against. Um, so Sylvia Winter, um, I'm going to just like sprinkle her theory throughout to sort of make, a, make, make an argument about blockchain and the potential of it. Um, so she uh, wrote about how the history of colonialism uh, and the history of capitalism are uh, intertwined with each other. Um, and she says uh, colonialism was also um, a way for early capitalism to uh, emerge. Uh, col colonizers um, arrived to a space that they treated as a blank slate, um, reducing human labor, human to labor, nature to land. Um, and sort of imposing systems of ownership onto uh, nature uh, that were unfamiliar to the people, uh, to the in indigenous people using them at the time. Um, and humans in this process became um, individually disposable, uh, but inter integral, like collectively integral a assets to this herbal, er early global uh, capitalism um, and nature and the crops that we can um, that it can uh, give us uh, went from use value um, to exchange value so it's a market uh, started to uh, emerge um, and what Sylvia Winter says is really this sort of domination and marketization sort of reinforce each other um, all the time they're, they're always intertwined um, so what does this have to do with blockchain? Um, 
there is um, so data colonialism is a term that um, has been worked a lot of, on in recent years, mostly outside of blockchain. Um, so it, it was uh, a term that Nick Goldry and Ulysses Mejias um, worked a lot about uh, on, um, and they show how um, the way data functions. It parallels really a lot with um, the, the historical colonialism's function within the, this is a quote, by the way, historical colonialism's function within the development of economies on a global scale, its normalization of resources, uh, resource appropriation, and its redefinition of social relations that uh, dispossession came to seem natural. So the sort of readying life uh, for extraction without limits. Um, and uh, this data colonialism has also, there have been uh, some certain people uh, recently in the sort of blockchain research space that have tried to uh, understand how this term also relates to blockchain systems. Uh, Gillian Crandall, for example, uh, does uh, work in on uh, what Ruth also uh, mentioned earlier, the, this uh, process that's been going on in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, where wealthy crypto investors, usually from the US, white male, you know, the usuals, uh, buying up property, rising the energy prices, basically occupying, um, again, something as if it is a blank slate. Um, Peter Housen uh, really looks at how the, nor this, the, the blockchain systems can also sort of reinforce uh, north-south power dy dynamics in the way they uh, codify um, inclusion and, and participation in their systems. Um, and Olivier Utel uh, also talks about this uh, as emerging carto cartographies of control. Um, and um, that again, sort of reproducing north-south power uh, dynamics. And often this happens sort of under the guise of sort of lofty societal goals, like, you know, solving climate, uh, climate change. And this picture is of uh, a project called NEMAS, which I hope to write something about at some point. Um, but it uh, basically tokenizes the Amazon rainforest um, and also in a way that like if there's a cave or a waterfall, your NFT is worth more. So this sort of a rarity economy. Um, I see very frustrating looks glaring back at me. Uh, <laughs> that's how I feel too. Um, uh, and then on top of that also, these, the, the owners of these NFTs are then organized into a DAO that then can make decisions about what, what to do with all of this and sort of govern. Um, of course, there's a layer of alienation abstraction between the actual rainforest and the NFT. So that's a sort of, we don't know how much influence they actually have, but the idea is that they have influence. Um, and um, just like in historical colonialism, labor and land, um, uh, sorry, humans and nature turned into labor and land. Uh, these to sort of tokenized representations of the world are abstracted assets that promise a sort of stream of future income with little care for the thing that they represent. Um, back to Sylvia Winter. Um, another parallel that I think is important to trace is um, her critique of how humanistic knowledge systems throughout the centuries um, uh, sort of create the um, sort of exploitable less than human other um, and universalize Western man as man, as humanity. She says man, I think nowadays maybe we would use another term, but um, and she says that since the Renaissance, this has been starting, right? That um, the Renaissance was a break with the sort of medieval religious uh, orders of, of, 
of life and, and knowledge um, and uh, new political forms started to emerge, uh, secularization um, and Western man came to be seen as um, secular and civilized as opposed to the spiritual and savage other, uh, colonial other. Um, and in the Enlightenment, uh, later on, this sort of was expanded along with sort of scientific um, expansions as well. For example, um, uh, Linnaeus's um, systems of ordering the world, right? That's nature into categories, um, also the sort of invention of race uh, and their characteristics. If you read it, it's um, insane. Um, that are, that offer a sort of biological proof for this separation, right? Um, a separation between Western man and less than human other that can be exploited because they're less than human. Um, and this happens at the same time as capitalism is unfolding. Um, and throughout the ages, maybe in more recent years, we've have had uh, this figure of uh, homo economicus sort of emerge out of this rational man that is able to save himself in the free market. And if you're poor, that's your own fault because you've just not ha acted in a, in a rational, uh, self-sufficient way. So this bioeconomic man um, Winter says still exists today um, and it, in the process um, still this other becomes unworthy um, and you, you can think of algorithms I think someone already mentioned Sophia Noble um, also someone like Rua Benjamin like the, they really show how basically how Linnaeus's orders of the world are still reproduced in these algorithms and cr creating divisions uh, and reinforcing racial categories, uh, all under the guise of uh, neutrality and scientific objectivity. So it's really the similar, similar systems going on. And this is also data colonialism. Um, and Katriona Gray actually um, makes an important nuance to how this data colonialism and its, its um, uh, how it functions, basically. She says that it's not just orders of knowledge, but now it's also orders of value. These things are interacting. Um, so whereas nature and life occurred in a pre-commodified form, the data that we produce now is always already sort of in the context of these economic uh, relations. Um, and this is especially true for blockchain, I would say. Um, and for, if you think back to NEMAS, the Amazon Forest Project, um, you can see that really maps an order of knowledge, what is represented, what is not, um, what kind of rarity exists, um, and as well, an order of value. Um, what does that rarity translate into as, a, as an economic value? Um, what is visible and what is valuable thus, and what is not visible, what is not valuable? And also, who has the capacity to act on these things? Um, then another way that I think really resonates blockchain with uh, what Sylvia Winter has been saying is, um, the idea that Western man is truth, is the truth, like is, is the, is man, is human, um, that throughout the ages sort of this different order of truth that was imposed. And blockchain also as a sort of, it's been talked about a lot in, this, in relation to producing, being able to produce a truth through its, uh, its algorithms. Um, especially in the context of a po the post-truth era and this need for a new sort of shared way of seeing the world. And um, this book, uh, The Truth Machine, really dives deep into this, um, where the, the authors write, blockchain is a, 
record keeping method that brings to us a commonly accepted version of the truth that is more reliable than any truth we've ever seen. <laughs> um, so blockchain doesn't give us a universal truth, it renders a truth universal, just like Western man was rendered universal. Um, and this truth is, overrepresents market-based views of value, invisibilizing those things that are not deemed valuable. Um, and now comes the shift. <laughs> um, these, uh, but all of these things that I've been talking about, I think we should see as affordances, right? It's not, we shouldn't, it's not deterministically this way. Uh, we can do things differently. We have to think about them differently and act about them differently. Um, but we need to be aware of this, these possibilities. And the very, the economic and political and social power that is in these um, imaginaries. Um, so let's look at brighter things. Um, and for that, I want to go back again to Sylvia Winter and sort of use her work not only to critique, but also to see what, what is possible within her world, her, her view on, on how the world works. Um, so in her work, she also, she describes that on uh, colonial plantations, there were also plots, and plots were uh, little pieces of land um, that plantation owners would um, provide their slaves, uh, enslaved people with. Um, but not as a sort of uh, gift that was compassionate or anything, but basically as a cost-reducing uh, measure, a piece of land that was not very valuable to, uh, to use in the plantation because it was rocky ground or whatever, not very arable. Um, but it was, um, the enslaved people were made to provide for themselves, grow their own crops with this plot. Um, at the same time, these plots provided a way, a, a place away from the plantation to relate differently, to remember um, cultures that, uh, where people hailed from or uh, different ways of um, relating uh, different, different mythologies that people uh, remembered. Um, and what's important in all of this is that what Sylvia Winter says, Western man is not truth, it's a story that we've been told. And to imagine different ways of being together, we also need to tell different stories. Um, so this plot is a way to practice, is a place to practice different social relations and a way to create new mythologies about what, how life, what is the value of life, how do we live together? Um, where do we hail from and where are we going um, to create these things together and sow the seed of resistance. And in thinking about what could be blockchain's plot, I've been inspired by the work of uh, Patricia de Vries, um, who um, is thinking uh, about what plot work as an artistic praxis could be. Uh, so she's um, thinking about the way art uh, is always embedded in these colonial, uh, sorry, capitalist uh, relations as well, uh, and how it could create plots to relate differently. Um, so I'm thinking we need those plots for the blockchain. <laughs> um, what could they be? I'm, I'm trying to think through her sort of proposition of, um, thinking about art as, uh, as a possible plot. Um, so, I have some examples. Um, the first one is about care relations, and um, this is a work by Sarah Friend called Life Forms. Um, and I think it's interesting because care and capitalism seem to sort of oppose each other. They always, they create friction. Um, 
care is always undervalued in capitalism. Um, and that's why it's a really important, like with all this history that I've been talking about, like care seems to be like the thing we need to focus on. Um, and um, so Life Forms is an NFT uh, collection um, where you buy uh, the life form, the NFT, uh, and you have to give it away uh, within 90 days to someone else for free. Um, and the NFTs have a set price, they're always the same. Um, and what I like about this, it's a very simple, small thing, um, but it's, it sort of takes the NFT out of the financial relation and asks people to care for something rather than capitalize on something. Um, so this, I think, is, is a really inspiring project that could hopefully lead to much more. Um, much more care. Then on the topic of so different social relations, um, new mythologies is I think the two central sort of things that Winter mentions. Uh, you've already seen this picture earlier uh, today. Um, and I think I've been reading Radical Friends a lot. And I think actually um, a lot of what I read really resonates with this idea of uh, uh, plot work. Um, creating different social relations based on different mythologies. So what I, what I read in the, in the book is sort of an understanding of DAOs as prefigurative practice uh, of creating different, different little corners inside a bigger extractivist system. And that is, I think, a way to describe a plot. Um, so prefigurative practice as, DAO, as, as uh, plot work. Uh, also, um, DAOs as places of worlding that have historical awareness while making new futures. Um, and what I think is really important in the context of blockchain is using mysticism as a tool in the context of all this sort of tokenization that makes things like economically valuable um, while uh, forgetting about all the rest because it becomes invisible. Um, I think mysticism is something that we can used to make things ungraspable and unextractable. Uh, and this is something that I also see very much, uh, particularly in uh, Penny Rafferty's contributions to the, to the book, um, where, for example, this black swan diagram, um, to me, seems like a sort of a, a story about a history and a future and a way of being together that cannot really be reduced very easily. Um, and uh, she talks about also DAOs as sigils and I put this picture here of Gnosis DAO, which is uh, Kia Kreutler uh, is involved in that, which I also think is sort of a sigil. So a sigil is a sort of magical uh, symbol, right? That, um, is used to um, represent intentions and also by sort of ritualizing um, these intentions, they also sort of lead to different realities and uh, DAOs as a way to be very clear about where you want to go and by vote, voting and proposing um, uh, actions, sort of ritualizing those intentions, um, which I think is also sort of mystical way of thinking about these things. Um, yeah, so these things all sort of, to me, make it seem like DAOs could be, could be plots. Um, they might be, doesn't mean that they will be. I mean, this again, being not deterministic works both ways. Um, we have to be very careful, but there is really 
um, potential in um, imagining together new mythologies and um, defining social relation, relations together uh, in ways that harness them against easy capture. Um, so this is, this is where I get my hope from, um, despite all the, all the other stuff that I've been talking about. Um, it's about unlearning colonialism while relearning care. Um, that's what I wanted to share with you.